Hey everyone, it's Casimus Lego, and in this video, we'll be taking a look at two custom Lego minifigures from Denis Villeneuve's Dune Part 2, which has finally been released to continue the story of author Frank Herbert's iconic science fiction novel. For this video, I have upgraded my custom Paul Atreides minifigure from the first Dune project, and I've made from the ground up the psychotic heir to House Harkonnen, Fade Raltha, who is making his first appearance after being omitted from Part 1. Now, I'm very excited to see Villeneuve's vision for his adaption continue on screen, and so far it appears audiences across the world are loving it, which is absolutely fantastic for me as a fan of both the original novel and of the 2021 film adaption. I hope you're looking forward to this video, so without any further ado, let's go ahead and get a close-up look at both of these custom LEGO minifigures. Let's begin by talking about my newest version of Paul Atreides, also known as the Moadib and Prophet to the Fremen people. Now from the beginning of this project, I knew exactly how I was going to make him. The figure that I made for the first Dune film from 2021 was one of my favorite figures that I've ever made, so using that figure as a base to spring off of was a fantastic choice, so all I've done is essentially upgrade him with a few new details and accessories. Some new additions include brand new fabric elements, some alternate heads, and an entirely new painted back that the original figure did not have. We'll discuss these details and more as we go over this minifigure. It's been a while since I've shown off Paul in his Fremen made still suit, so I'm excited to talk about this figure again. Let's start at the bottom of the feet. Aside from a basic repaint, I made no changes to the front of the legs. Even now, I'm fond of the way that I managed to cram all of the various elements from the film costume into this pair of legs. I also think that the decision I made to sculpt the knee pads instead of painting them like I had planned early on was a great choice. And the lighter brown highlights that I painted helped to add a nice visual quality, especially in the form of the desert boot wraps that are painted all around each leg. The painted tube details on the top of the legs are also really well done. The torso features multiple painted details and 3D e-tape layers to replicate the multiple hoses, padding, and water recycling devices on the suit. All these details are painted in dark gray and feature a light gray outline. Meanwhile, the undersuit is painted in dark brown, which I still believe was the best choice when depicting the rugged still suit scene in the film. I do remember the distinct challenge I ran into when designing the initial torso, which for me was arranging all of the accurate pieces in a satisfying style without making it appear too muddy and cluttered, so I'm very pleased with how it turned out in the end. In fact, while we're looking at the torso, I'll go ahead and remove both the fabric robes and cape to give you a look at what the figure looks like with just the still suit alone. And this gives me the best opportunity to show you the back that I've painted, which like I mentioned before, did not exist on the original figure. I based this design primarily from the McFarlane Toys action figure. I like how I did this because despite the nearly three years separating this design from the rest of the figure, I still attempted to make it in the exact same style to keep it consistent. That meant painting the dark gray paddings and light gray outlines in an identical fashion, and also including the 3D e-tape layers. As you can see, there are at least three separate layers of e-tape on the back of this torso to build up the various pieces. Additionally, I want to highlight the gunmetal series of lines that I painted just beneath the top pads. I really like how they came out. I also modified the arms from the first version of the figure. Before, I had sculpted onto the top of each arm to represent the thin sleeves of the fabric cape. Well, for this updated version, I've gone ahead and removed those details and replaced them with the shoulder pads. And I like this more since now I can maintain the look of the suit when I remove the fabric cape. Which, speaking of, the capes are nothing fancy. I ditched the old trench coat that I did in favor of the tannish rags that Paul wears in part 2, but in essence, it's basically the same piece just in a different color. And actually, the proper cape is not new at all. I simply carried it over from the last version and just repainted it. I did consider making a new cape with a fabric scarf to match the rest of the fabric elements seen on the figure, but the sculpting that I did just won me over. In fact, I'm surprised how seamless I was able to make it. Paul's head is still the same head as before. It's a modified Legolas print from the LEGO Lord of the Rings 2014 wave, and I've carried it over because I'm still quite fond of how it looks. I personally believe it looks a lot like Timothy Chalamet. I did, however, modify it from the original, in the case of painting his cheekbones. 
this head is pretty neutral, and if you want to see him with a little bit more personality, you're in luck because I've also added the aggressive expression to the figure. Just as I did to the basic expression, I removed the original cheekbones and painted my own, and I've also repainted the pupils and eyebrows. Unlike the static, serious look that the first version had, I'm glad to have captured some more facial variation this time around. And to round things out even more, I modified another head, this time with the nose plugs and the characteristic blue eyes that the Fremen inherit from the Spice Melange. Now, I didn't want to pass up the opportunity to add these details to the final figure. I didn't think Paul would be complete without at least representing the nose plug in some form. Now, before I talk about this custom hairpiece, I want to go ahead and show another really cool accessory that I've created for the figure. That is, the still suit mask that Paul wore throughout part one. It's a fairly simple piece, it's just sculpted and painted, and even though it's not completely accurate, the removable ability really makes up for it in my opinion. Because it's not connected to the head itself, it can be easily paired with any of the three heads that I've already shown you, which I think is super cool. I made sure there was a ton of variety with this figure. Paul used to don a Mad-Eye Moody hairpiece, but for this updated version, I went ahead and used another custom hairpiece from Firestar Toys. I spent a good week or so looking for a replacement for the original hair, and when I came across this piece from their website, I thought it would be perfect to represent Paul's messy, unkept desert hair. And with a simple repaint in a custom-made dark brown color, I think it worked out marvelously. It's way more accurate than the old one. We've seen a lot of variation with this minifigure, but believe me, I'm not done yet. This is an entire separate look for Paul. His fabric cape and hairpiece can be switched out for his Fremen hood and flowing robes. These two pieces go really well together. This cape is just a simple fabric over cape that I've made separately, but the hood was a bit more challenging. For one, I had to find a good base piece. My options included any of LEGO's existing hood elements, but I didn't think that any of them would capture the look that I wanted. This piece also came from Firestar Toys, I believe it is called a peaked hood, and I modified it significantly. I sanded the tip in the back to achieve that rounded look, and then I sculpted the front of the hood to better shape it. I even sculpted a separate layer on the inside of the hood to obtain the inner tannish hood, which is accurate to the film based on the references that I was using. And while the outer hood was mostly a straightforward piece to shape, the inner hood was much more challenging. My problem came when shaping the fabric-like drapes near each corner. Based on the space, it was tough to get my tools on there to shape it, and to achieve this look, I had to sculpt different layers and merge them together. When all was said and painted, I don't think you can tell a difference. It's that seamless. Pairing this hood with this headpiece in particular is perfect. With those blue eyes and this menacing draped hood, Paul looks just as elegant as the Fremen Prophet should. Despite all the upgrades that I've done to this Paul Atreides figure, the Chris knife required no such modification, nor did I make anything else for him to wield. The sublime intersecting rings that I painted on the blade were perfect first time around, and it looks just as great in these hands as it did in that first version. All in all, I thought the figure was really great before, but these new upgrades really take this figure to the next level. I hope you've enjoyed this comprehensive look at my new custom LEGO minifigure of the potential Kwisatz Haderach, Paul Atreides, and now, let's shift sides and discuss his psychotic rival. That rival in question is none other than the nephew of the Baron himself, Fade Rautha Harkonnen. This is the only other minifigure that I wanted to make, but like his character in-universe, he was intimidating to approach. It took me a while to plan out all of the ins and outs of the costume. I didn't want to wing it, and thankfully, I had a lot of reference material. Like his rival from House Atreides, I based much of this design off of the McFarlane Toys action figure. Additionally, his guest appearance in Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 of all places proved to be a massive help when making the figure, and thanks to the images showcasing the model from the game that I was able to look at, I think he turned out really well. Funny enough, I think this figure is kind of simpler than Paul, just in the fact that I didn't make nearly as much variation as I did on him, though Fade still required many sculpted and 3D elements. But before I jump into the many different details, his cape is nothing fancy. It's just a standard black fabric cape that I trimmed, and I painted the gloss black edge. I don't expect him to wear it much, most of the references from the film itself lacked his cape, and instead came straight from the McFarlane Toys action figure. Being as simple as it is, it can totally be removed, and now Fade Rautha here looks a lot more faithful to his depiction on screen. 
Since we've got a ton of detail to look at, let's start at the bottom and work our way up. So starting at the legs, I'll first talk about the base wrinkles that I've painted. This is still a particular style I'm trying to get more into, as I only paint leg wrinkles on select figures. But I thought Fade certainly would benefit from some kind of indication of realism. The pants in the film costume appear to be pretty scrunched, especially on the thighs, so I think I've replicated that pretty accurately. The shoe design that I have painted on all sides of the legs is also pretty well done. In terms of sculpting, there are knee pads, these pocket-shaped things on the sides of the legs, and of course, the ankle armor, which stumped me for a long time. I had to shrink it down, but I still think I captured it accurately. Each side is sculpted in two layers, the first being the base plate, and the second being the layer that wraps around the front of the leg. And to top off the look, I even added just a tiny silver square, even though there's supposed to be two. I painted all the pieces in gunmetal and even added the silver outline, which was much trickier than I expected. The waist piece also has some sculpting in the form of the cod plate and the two belt plates off on either side. In particular, I like the piece in the middle a lot. If you look closely, you can actually make out some painted details below these four sculpted belt pieces. Nothing crazy, just six independent thin lines, but I'm quite fond of the painted and sculpted elements, which is a common theme you'll see on the rest of the figure. Moving swiftly up, the torso is a little bit more involved. This time around, the front of the stomach is raised thanks to the E-tape layers that I applied, with the base black painted torso creating a natural edge in between these pieces though I still added a gunmetal outline just to help them stand out visually. These side pieces are also E-tape and are neatly tucked just underneath these sculpted straps that are connected to the main chest plate. I'll give myself a pat on the back for this one. This shape was really tricky to get right, and it didn't help that it needed to be thin enough to have the ability to connect the center strip to both the chest plate and this curved plate. My first attempt, unfortunately, did not work out, which as a result left some glue residue and is generally not as clean as I was hoping for. Regardless, this attempt yielded me the correct shape. Meanwhile, the painted wrinkles continue here on the torso. Swinging around to the back has an entire design as well. I tried to incorporate the same approach to the back as I did on the front, so I sculpted different layers of the armor, including this strip of black that I ended up glossing over for the shiny effect the continuation of the straps, and the back plates. Of course, all outlined when appropriate. Notice how the shoulder pieces begin on the torso and then naturally bend over the top, though it sadly doesn't connect to the plate from the front. And again, I blended in some painted simple details on both the black armor plates. In terms of the arms, they are just as complex as the rest of the figure. Both arms feature fully custom sculpted shoulder pads. To get these specific shapes, I had to be patient and work in overlapping layers. While I do think I captured the basic shape, I probably could have cleaned up the edges a bit better. Now what actually disappoints me about these shoulder guards is that I made them a little bit too big, because if you happen to notice, they ended up covering a design that I spent hours painting. On both arms, I painted a set of three thin gray lines that begin on the forearm and then curve up to the sides of the arms. At first, I was really proud of them, and then when I put the armor onto the shoulder, I realized that they were both going to end up covering most of these lines, which is incredibly unfortunate. So that's a poor calculation on my part, but thankfully the front of these details are still visible, so at least you can still make them out. And they both feed into these dry sculpted boxes too. The rest of the arms are taken up by the forearm plates, which are also sculpted very closely to the armor on the ankles. I think they have a consistent relation. Before attaching them though, I had to make sure that I painted the strap-like details beforehand, which are represented by these lines that run around the entire arm and connect under the armor. And to top them both off, I've given Fade a set of custom black glove tops to match his black Lego hands. Now that we've taken a look at all of the various armor plates, we can talk about his head, which is, you know, nicely painted, but it isn't all that great at capturing Austin Butler's likeness. Sure, he has a shiny noggin, but something about it just is off to me. I think it just has to do with the pupils. Notoriously, I sometimes just can't get it looking naturally like an official Lego print. At least I managed to make him look aggressive without the use of eyebrows, which is in itself a simple accomplishment. I do like the clean cheekbones that I added though, I think they help with the look. Either way, the rest of the head is totally blank and I've included no alternate heads. So accessories are a bit limited, but I made sure to at least make both his black and white blades. 
They are simple, but the custom molded pieces really make up for it. These pieces are modified elven knives from Muse Bricks Arts on Etsy. I'm not sure if they are the original maker, but I purchased these from them. And I landed on these because I really like how they resemble the curves of the blades on the actual swords carried by Fade Rautha in the film. I just painted the longer knife in black and the shorter knife in silver, and I think they came out perfectly. And with all the details looked at, that's it for Fade Rautha and for both of my custom LEGO minifigures from Dune Part 2. Thank you very much for watching, I hope you've enjoyed taking a look at these minifigures, and now we can go ahead and conclude this review. Alright, that's going to be it for both of these custom LEGO minifigures. Thank you very much for checking out today's custom minifigure review video. If you have any thoughts or questions, be sure to let me know what you think by writing a comment below. Feedback is always encouraged. In the description, I've put links to my social media platforms, as well as the direct links to the parts that I've used and taken inspiration from. So if you're interested, be sure to check them out. That's about it from me, so as always, I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye. Thank you.